going to be studying one of the greatest events in Pentecostal history, which is really its birth, and then its catalyst uh, movement from Los Angeles into the entire world. We're going to be looking at two men. I decided to combine these two men since they play a very important role together and their lives have intertwined to create one of the most intriguing stories of Pentecostal history. In the last session, we talked about uh, the Welsh Revival, and I made the comment that I'd like to state here again that I believe that God chose the Welsh Revival to begin the Pentecostal or the Holy Spirit's baptism with the evidence of speaking in tongues in Wales. But because of the circumstances and all that was happening there, it was lost. And almost to the month and probably to the day that the great Welsh revivalist Evan Roberts began to go from the scene, the move of God that was in Wales sprung out of Wales and came to Los Angeles. There was a man by the name of Frank Bottleman who was a writer and a Christian speaker, not so much a traveling minister, but spoke as a Christian author around the Los Angeles County in Southern California that had been corresponding with Evan Roberts about how to get the revival to Los Angeles. Well, the revival actually came. Uh, in 1906 to Los Angeles through a, a black man by the name of William J. Seymour. But to understand the full uh, happenings of Azusa Street, we must go back to another man by the name of Charles F. Parham in Topeka, Kansas. And so we're going to look at his life for a few moments, and then we're going to look at the life of William J. Seymour, and then we're going to bring them together at Azusa Street, and then watch the Pentecostal movement spring from there. Uh, Every revival is born like a baby, and a baby must be cared for and must be given attention to. If you don't care for and give attention to it, it eventually goes off into error, or what you may call it goes and dies. The Pentecostal revival began with a lot of needs. That Mother Edda that we talked about earlier helped the young churches and the young believers stabilize in the Word and in doctrine and a moving of the Spirit. But we want to look here for a few moments at the life of Charles F. Parham. He was born in the same state that Billy Sunday, the great sawdust evangelist, was born in. Uh, Parham was born June the 4th, 1873, in Iowa. Uh, his family moved from Iowa to Kansas in 1878, and he began to attend, when he moved to Kansas, his first Sunday school that he remembers in his life. When you read about his life story and you read about all that uh, is occurring uh, in his early life, he says these words. He says, all I remember is being sick and being weak. His whole ch childhood and his teenage years was full of sickness. I have a list here of all the different things that happened to him. He contracted a fever at nine years of age that left him bedridden for months. Then he got inflammatory uh, arthritis throughout his body that left him tied up in knots. He got another fever that got him sick again to the point where they said you could hold his hand up to a light and he was so thin you could count the bones in his hand by just looking through the light and didn't need an x-ray machine. He was so thin and frail. He recovered from that for just a few seasons of his life and all of a sudden he, uh, he got a tapeworm that began to take all of the, his insides and cause digestive problems and the medicine the doctors gave him uh, tore up his insides to the point that he didn't grow for a couple of years of his life and he got another fever. So the poor man, every place you turn around in his childhood is always suffering with sickness and disease. But he believed that God had called him to preach. It's, it's amazing to me that all these preachers that God calls go through so much suffering. And I think mainly they suffer because they don't know any better and, and they don't know how to resist the devil and believe God for victory. But hopefully you'll be able to do that and I'll go through all these trials that are necessary. His mother dies in December of 1885. His father's remarried the following year. At the age of 13, Parham said he became a converted Christian. He gave his life to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then at the age of 14, uh, the Methodist Church licensed him as a minister, as an exhorter, which is their first level of credentials in the Methodist Church. And at the age of 15, he held his first public meeting. And so he began quite young uh, as a young preacher. I think everybody, as soon as the call of God comes on us to start doing something and not waiting until uh, they get to a certain age in life to start achieving. To me, that's a lie of the devil. You don't have to wait until you're 30. 40, 50 to begin to preach. As soon as it comes on you, start taking the doors that are, to, that are given to you and walking through them. At the age of 16, he kind of left the public ministry and began to go to the college to, to learn uh, other studies as well as his religious interests he was studying too. And he became back sudden. When he got uh, back sudden, he said he became ill again. Uh, I think when you get uh, out of the way from the move of God and the will of God, you can get on the devil's territory and he'll try to take advantage of you that way. While on his deathbed, he said, I don't know if it was that bad on his deathbed, but he said, while on his deathbed, uh, he called out to God and said he'll, he'll go back to preaching. And he said he recovered from his illness quite quickly uh, after he made that confession and that promise to the Lord. At the age of 21, he began full-time evangelistic ministries. And December 
December 3, 1896, he got married to a wonderful lady named Sarah. They had their first son the following year, and that year is the, the year that he began to reach out to understand the healing ministry. The scripture, Physician, Heal Thyself, began to cause a movement inside of his being to find out about the healing ministry. So what he did, uh, he went over to Chicago to see Dr. Dowie's healing homes in the city of Chicago to see how Dowie ran them. He went to another man by the name of Sanford that was kind of a off doctrine and thought he was Jesus reincarnated back on the earth. But he went there to see how he was running his healing homes. And he came back to Kansas and decided he would open up his own healing home in 1898. He established what he called the Bethel home. Now, a healing home again for you that are just joining us is a place where they uh, either bought a big home like a mansion style home, you know, two or three stories with many rooms in it, or leased it from the owner, and have people who need healing to come and take up the rooms, and while they're there, they take, let go of their medicine, they don't obey the doctor's uh, orders, they come in there and they trust God only for healing. If God don't heal them, they're going to die. And so in the early Pentecostal movement, we have a lot of the teaching on those lines that doctors are of the devil and, and medicines of the devil. Well, probably back in the days, like I told you earlier in this series, with with Dowie and different ones, medical science was not as exact and as uh, a great blessing as it is today. They were still trying to learn what did what and what surgery would help you and what medicines would do this. And so again, some of that philosophy came out of a good heart and not just an ignorance because many people went and took the medicines and went and got surgery and came back worse than when they went in. But I think today's a little bit different. God can use medicine. Uh, he's not against medicine. Uh, he can use it to keep you alive while your faith gets strong enough where you don't need it no more. And thank God, while you're growing in your faith to get to a place called divine health, uh, if you need medicine, go ahead and use it and keep on going. Don't sit there and suffer. God does not want you to suffer any way at all. You can get healed by divine action or take an aspirin if you need that. There's no problem uh, in those arenas. But in the early days of Pentecostal uh, movement and the, the healing movement, there was that philosophy, and I kind of understand it and don't take a hard core attitude toward it. But so he goes back to Kansas, and he starts uh, uh, to open a healing home and begins to advertise, come and, and uh, let me pray for you and help you rise up and be healed. And he begins to get some great miracles. Then he decides he wants to start a Bible school. Well, this was a great event for Charles Parham. In 1900, October of that, uh, of that year, he opened a Bible school in Topeka, Kansas called the Bethel College. He has the Bethel Healing Home, and now he's got the Bethel College. And there was a, a man by the name of Mr. Stone that was trying to build a big, beautiful mansion for his personal residence. He had become personal wealthy uh, in another city uh, by, I guess he, they said he was a, a man that took care of nurseries in the sense of growing plants and did some type of uh, gardening work and become very wealthy and moved to Kansas there and was building this elaborate, beautiful home. They called it the most beautiful home in all of Topeka at that time. Well, the problem was uh, there came a, an economic depression. He lost a lot of his money, so it became known as Stone's Folly because he couldn't finish it. It had a high tower, had several stories, big, beautiful uh, rooms and wooden staircases and some things he brought from Europe to put in there. And he was so disgusted with it that he decided to run out to Charles Parham, which was a great blessing to him. So Charles Parham signed the lease and said he was going to um start this Bible school, and here's how he got his students. He put an ad in some of the local newspapers and some of the Christian PR articles that were around at that time saying, all those who want to come and live on common ground, meaning you come here and you put all your money into one, one pot and we'll uh, believe God to take care of the food bill, the rent bill, the light bill, and all these things. We just come here and for this period of time we live as common people and we all share with one another and we're going to study God's word and then we're going to go out and evangelize the world. Charles Parham's heart was strong and world evangelism. And as we get further into his story, we'll see how that evangelistic heart moved with the Pentecostal movement that made it spread so quickly like wildfire. Well, so he started the school, and a few students came from different parts of the country and parts of Kansas, and uh, they began to teach them. He preached the wholeness doctrine. He preached sanctification. He was very strong in the coming of the Lord and, and the return of Christ. He was wanting to know he's coming soon. Uh, Old Testament was very strong with him. But he got to the place in the book of Acts where they got to a little problem. And the problem was about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What was the evidence that a person had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Now others would say it was the, you know, they received power. But how do you know you receive power? So these questions he brought up to his students. He said, I'm going to go the way to, 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 the, to the city here and hold some revival meetings here. When I come back, I want to hear what all of you have discovered on what it means and what the evidence of having the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. 
students. And this was a requirement of the students toward the end of the year of 1900, December of 1900. So when he came back from his revival meeting for preaching for two or three days, he found his whole student body was in prayer trying to receive the Holy Ghost. So he called them together, rang the bell. They all came together, quit their praying, and came together. And he said, well, what's the verdict? What's going on here? And they said, uh, President Palm, our, our conclusion is that when somebody has received the Holy Spirit, they speak in heavenly tongues that God gives them supernaturally. And we're all seeking that right now. And they went through all the references throughout the book of Acts and throughout the epistles that Paul wrote about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of speaking in tongues, and that tongues was the, the initial sign of a person receiving the infilling of the Holy Holy Spirit. He said, well, I, I don't know quite uh, how to take this. And a lady walked up to him named Agnes and said, uh, President Palm, lay your hands on me and ask the Holy Spirit to fill me so I can receive these holy tongues and go out and, and do what I'm called to do. Well, Parham said, I was a little reluctant because I had not yet studied it myself uh, to the point I was secure, nor had I received this baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So I wasn't quite sure. But you know women, they're persistent. And so she just stayed on Brother Parham and said, you know, you pray for me. You pray for me. You pray for me. And finally, because of her persistence, I believe, he reached out and laid his hands on her and began to pray and ask God to fill her with this Holy Spirit and, and let that evidence come forth in her life. And so he prayed a little prayer, something like what I just said, took his hands off of her and looked at her and stood there for a few moments. Nothing seemed to happen. And all of a sudden, himself and some fellow students there begin to see like a heavenly glow come over her face as they tell the story. And all of a sudden, an unusual language began to come up out of her mouth and it began to come out like a river. And she could not speak in English for several days after receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. She also was given the ability to speak in perfect Chinese. And, and this was documented by governmental linguists that came there when they began to hear about this phenomena in Kansas. And when this happened, the people began to seek God even stronger. Now, I have to tell you this. There were some students. There was two men that were students in the school that thought they'd all gone crazy and left the school. But all the other students stayed, and the few church members and some fellow ministers in the community came and began to hear about this Pentecostal restoration. Now, Charles Parham called it the apostolic faith or primitive faith has been restored, meaning the primitive faith, the faith of the apostles and what God did for them has now come back to us in a restoration, and this was for the purpose of world evangelism. Now, in the early days of the Pentecostal experience in Topeka, Kansas, there was a term that Parham coined that we don't use much today, and that, and that uh, phrase is mission tongues. What they begin to call the baptism of the Holy Spirit was these were tongues with a mission, and what they believed that you spoke in a heavenly language, it was a communication between you and God, but as well as God would give you a language that would be someplace where you were called an African language or a dialect from an African nation or a Chinese dialect or some Asian dialect uh, from the, the Oriental world, and that meant that's where you were called to go and to to preach the gospel, that God had given you that language, and when you got there, you just stood up and prayed in those tongues, or spoke out in those tongues, and the people would hear you, and they would get the message, and get saved, and come to Jesus. Well, that sounds kind of wild to us today, but you want to know something, that's one reason why the Pentecostal experience spread so rapidly all over the world, because that actually happened. And as the Pentecostal movement grew, they began to make fun of that and just focus on the prayer language that God gave you to communicate and to pray with Him and to communicate with Him with. But also in the early days, even we see in the book of Acts and in the days of early Pentecost at the turn of the century here, was that they had that ability and that's why they bought a boat ticket and they went to Africa. They bought a boat ticket, went to Russia, bought a boat ticket, went to the Middle East, went to, you know, Southeast Asia. They went everywhere because that's how they felt God had called them to go. And Parham believed this is one that would speed up world of evangelism so the Lord could come quickly and take his bride home. Well, Mr. Stone wanted his, wanted his house back. He didn't want no longer to give Charles Parman and the students the, uh, the use of his home. And so he brought it back and he gave it to a bootlegger to rent from him and it exploded and burned up. And so the home where the Topeka, Kansas revival began, or the baptism of the Holy Spirit's restoration began, as we know it today, actually blew up and burned up because they rented it out to a, a bootlegger that caught the thing on fire. Charles Parham told Mr. Stone, he said, if you take this away from me, God will judge you 
and no one will ever use this house again. Well, I guess he learned it was the truth. And to this day, if you go to Topeka, Kansas, on the spot where the, the mansion once stood, there is nothing there still to this day. It is surrounded by buildings, but on the actual spot, there's nothing ever been built since the day it burnt down. So I guess I could say when God curses something, it's cursed for a lifetime because nothing's still there. They play, they play soccer on the field that was once the foundation of this great of this great building where the Pentecostal Restoration began. Charles Parham thought everybody was going to run to this and accept it, but he met some resistance. Boy, did he meet some resistance. When he began to go out and preach primitive Christianity and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, people began to think he was crazy. The Topeka newspapers had begun to report about it. It is said that the, that was the headlines, Pentecost, and the little newsboys used to run down the street screaming the headlines to sell the papers, scream that day, Pentecost, Pentecost, read all about it. And they sold the newspapers by screaming the word Pentecost and people speaking in tongues. Well, he went to a place called... Uh, in Kansas, Galena, Kansas, was where he held his first successful Pentecostal revival. He'd gone to the other places, but didn't quite receive the receptivity. Many ministers mocked him and thought he'd gone a little AWOL, but he went there by God's direction. Even some some folks told him, what are you going there for? There's nothing there. But God told him to go there, and he went there, and he held, put up his tent, and began to hold a revival meeting, and pretty soon he had over 800 converts, a few thousand people showing up, and they loved Brother Parham. But he was also was invited to go down to Orchard Park, uh, uh, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston, Texas. In Houston, Texas, he began to hold some other meetings about the Pentecostal restoration and the great apostolic faith coming back. He goes down there and begins to preach, and he says, you know, I need to start a school down here. So he starts a Bible school in Houston, Texas, and begins to teach the few students that come. Now, while he's down there, there's a man by the name of William J. Seymour, who, by a friend of his named Lucy, that was the, the nanny to Brother Palm's children, that had been a preacher in the holiness movement, they had befriended, uh, had got to talking and heard about this Bible school and what was going on, and Seymour liked it and went over and said, I want to be a part of it. So, but he was a, a black man. And in these days, the Jim Crow laws controlled the whole society. That means blacks and whites could not be together and the civil rights movement had not begun uh, in, in this country. This is early 1900s. You know, 1901, 1902, 1903, this thing is moving here, 1904, it's, it's this time period. And so Brother Parham himself is trying to obey the laws of the land. He said, but we still enjoy our our, our black brothers to be among us. So what they did, uh, I don't know if I'd have done that, I'd have put Brother Seymour right in the middle of the classroom, but what he did was he opened a door that was adjoining to the classroom and put Brother Seymour in the classroom all by himself, and Brother Seymour heard the teaching of Brother Parm and the other teachers uh, via the door because he couldn't be in there with all the other white students. But I always found it interesting, the first man that got an invitation that year was the man that had to sit in the classroom by himself which is Brother Seymour. And so he sat there, and he heard the Word, believed what he was taught, that it was Scripture that was for today, and he was moved in his heart, but he had not yet received the Holy Spirit's baptism himself. And Brother Palm was a, a unique personality. He also had this uh, love for the uh, Middle Eastern and uh, the Old Testament, so he would dress people up to get a crowd in Old Testament uh, clothes and Middle Eastern clothes and walk down the street and say the apostolic faith is back, and everybody would follow him and fall into the auditorium, and he'd start preaching to them salvation, healing, and baptism in the Holy Spirit. So Seymour was raised in that kind of environment. And at the end of the school year, he had received an invitation from California. They wanted him to come and hold a meeting in a Nazarene church in Southern California. So he went there, and it was nice. This will show you the heart of the students, and even Brother Parham. Parham at first didn't want him to go because he wanted him to help with what was happening in Houston and in Kansas, because at that time, the two main places of the Pentecostal movement was spreading was in Houston and up in Kansas. And then we come down into California. And so after the, the persistence of Seymour, he said, uh, I, I'll let you go. And so he went on out to California, and eventually Lucy, the lady that he knew, followed him out to California. He got up the first night in the Nazarene church where he was asked to preach, and he preached on Acts 2-4. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you'll speak with other tongues, and it's for everybody today. And today is a day of restoration, and he began to preach it. But he himself had not yet received the baptism with evidence of speaking in tongues, but he believed it. So he finished that night's meeting, thinking everything was fine and wonderful. Then all of a sudden, he came back the next day, walked up to the doors of the church. They were padlocked and with a note on the door, well, we don't believe you, we don't like you, we close the meeting down, it's over. 
Oh, not forever. Remember, it may look over, but God opens a door. And there was a couple who liked Seymour for some reason. And they lived at 216 Bonnie Bray Street. And they said, uh, Brother Seymour, why don't you come over to our house and uh, you, you teach us what's going on uh, in the restorational movements of God and tell us about this Holy Spirit and how to receive it. We, we believe. We need to know more, though, but we believe. So he goes over and begins to hold up what we call a, a, a cell meeting or a home meeting in this little bitty house, a little bitty, I've been in it. It's a little A-frame, like a little long house like this. And uh, you walk in, and when you go up to the front door, you can almost see the back door. And that's how big that little house is. So he gets up there, and he starts to teach on it and preach on it. And all of a sudden, some folks begin to receive the Holy Ghost, fall out on the floor and pray in tongues. Well, before you know it, everybody else is talking about it. Pretty soon, it's beginning to be noise or bother. But the Pentecostal restoration has come to California and is there. The Los Angeles Times begins to hear about it. They haven't quite reported it yet. But all of a sudden, the house fills up. People got the windows open. They got their head through the window trying to hear what's going on and receive. The front porch it fills up with so many people that the body weight makes the front porch fall off from the house and the whole crowd runs down or falls down the, the hill because it's built on a slope there and rolls down the hill. And you know Pentecostals from the very first day, we're always loud people. We're shouting, singing, and we're running, and we're giving God high praises and loud praises, and we're clapping and doing all these things. Well, the neighbors got mad. Can you imagine? you got this house full of people outside, inside. The front porch falls off. They're praying in tongues, falling down, rolling, screaming, all these things. They can't get any sleep. The police begin to be called, and Seymour realizes we've got to do something. One, we don't have enough room for the people, and number two, we're always getting in trouble with the policemen here, and this won't last forever. So they begin to look for a building. And so they're out looking for a building all over Los Angeles, and they come to the most famous address in Pentecostal history called 312 Azusa Street. The whole revival is called after that street. It's called the Azusa Street Revival. It's a two-story barn that used to be a horse stable. It was a church, a horse stable, and then it came back into being a church when Seymour went over to rent it. Seymour and a few of the men went over, cleaned it out, swept it out. Seymour would live up top in the second story, and the downstairs would be where they'd hold the meeting. When they finally got it all cleaned up, here's what they had. The pulpit was two chicken crates on top of each other, and the pews out there were just planks nailed together, sitting out there, and you just kind of sit there. There would be no backs to them, just kind of a, you know, a plank sitting out there on top of a, a couple stumps there, and that's how they built Azusa Street. And they begin to hold meetings. And all of a sudden, the whole thing would fill up. It could seat, I was told, up to 1,200 people could squish in and get into the, into the meeting. And for three and a half years, day and night, there never was a time when there was not a service or something going on in the altar of Azusa Street. Can you imagine being a pastor of a church that never had a day off? Can, can you imagine being an elder in a church that night and day for three and a half years, there never was nothing but church, 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 night and day, night and day, night and day, night and day. And that's what Azusa Street was. People People came from all over L.A. The L.A. Times came over and reported weird babblings that this Azusa Street thing. That was the first report in California about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The thing began to grow. The rich people came. The poor people came. All the racial people, all the different races came. And, and Azusa, there was no racial conflict. When there's a true move of God, black, white, yellow, and brown can all get together and feel so wonderful and so good and have no problem uh, interrelating because when God comes, his love is for everybody, and all these human things of prejudice disappear. If it's a true move, there will be no racial divide between any of the races, none whatsoever. If there is a division, then it's not really the Spirit of God, or they need to kind of grow up and get some things fixed. Well, Brother Seymour began to print a magazine called The Apostolic Faith, kind of named after Brother Parham. Parham now received a letter from Seymour saying, why don't you come and help me with this revival? This thing took off. I don't know what to do. We've got some trouble with some flesh. We can't discern flesh from spirit. We respect you as our spiritual father. Come, come, come. Well, Parham was back in the Kansas and, and Texas uh, points of Pentecostalism, but he wanted to go to Zion, Illinois, where Dowie had built the city, feeling that God had called him to heal the people and to bring Pentecostal restoration to the Zion people. Well, when he got there, he met much resistance. Dowie's successor, Volva, was a man that did not like it. He was already threatened by other people trying to take parts of Zion and the population and the followers there, but Parham became his worst nightmare because he came to town, people like F.F. F. Bosworth and, and the different ones of that uh, time period begin to say, we like Parham, we, we believe in what he's doing, and the crowds begin to grow and the Pentecostal experience begin to be felt there, but Volvo did not like Parham. He made up 
little posters and mail them around the city that these people make you lose your mind. These people bring, you know, germs that'll cause diseases. All these accusations. These people are heretics and false prophets. Stay away from them. Stay away from them. And so, but you can't stop the Holy Ghost when people are hungry. But Paul and uh, Vola got in a big old fight and a big old war going. So finally, he was there for a little bit and then he was done. He left Zion and began to respond to Seymour's response in California. And Parham uh, got out to Los Angeles, got there the first night and stood up to speak and got into the, into the mission. And uh, he looked around and he said, these things going on here that aren't right. He found people on the altar of Azusa Street with uh, spiritualistic act activities. Hypnosis was going on, as well as people receiving the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues, and God was healing people. There was great salvations going on. But he found that the two hypnotic, uh, hypnosis people that were controlled there came up to him at the end of his first message and told him, We don't want you here. We want you to leave. And Parmo, no, immediately say, uh, Seymour, we've got to clean this up. This is not right. He also had a little trouble with having the race, races intermixed there, which was not really a problem, but only in his heart. So there is a little trouble there uh, in the problem that with uh, uh, the, the racial conflict. In today's world of people are talking about Azusa Street, they are trying to make it a racial thing. But the first great fact about Azusa Street that oh, is over any other fact, now hear me clearly, is that people receive the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Everything else was secondary. Everything else that happened was good, was of God. The racial uh, camaraderie and the racial blending that came was of God. It was wonderful. Probably to me, the second greatest point of the revival. First was they received the Holy Ghost. And second was, even though the Jim Crow laws was the law of the land, everybody got together. The Chinese, the African Americans, the white man, the Norwegians, everybody got together and they received the Holy Ghost and began to go back to their peoples and back to their countries and spread the Pentecostal experience. Let us not forget why that revival occurred. It occurred mainly because God wanted people to receive the mighty power of the Holy Spirit and have that wonderful prayer language to communicate with Him and to intercede with and to begin to flow in the restoration of people's bodies through healing, through the gifts of the Spirit. He wanted them to have that, that inner dwelling of the Holy Ghost. That was the main reason for it. Any other reason is secondary. And I say that very strongly because in today's world, they're trying to rewrite history. And I'm against it because God first purpose with this revival was to get you filled with the Holy Ghost where you can be witnesses to every part of the earth that you're called to go to. Well, Seymour and Parham had conflict because Parham had a little bit of a heavy hand in the way he was trying to deal with these situations and split from Seymour, went a little few blocks from Azusa Street and took some people with him and had very successful meetings. But at the same time, this was actually the beginning of the decline of the Azusa Street revival over the conflict. Seymour eventually removed his ties from Brothers Parham and said that we once looked at him as our spiritual father, but knowing uh, being babes in Christ, we jumped too soon. He is not our spiritual father, but now we are going to follow the Lord alone and begin to step on out and do what they were called to do. Well, the Azusa Street Revival and Brother Seymour had some other future problems coming. One of the problems was one of the ladies there in the revival thought that Seymour was making a mistake when he decided to marry his wife. In that particular time period, some believed that you should never get married because the Lord is coming so soon. He's going to take your attention and time away from doing the Lord's work. So when he fell in love with his wife and decided to marry her, uh, this woman got all upset about it and stole his money list of over 50,000 people that had communicated with Azusa Street. And he was sending this magazine called The Apostolic Faith out to everybody to tell them who was receiving, what was going on, and give them teachings about how to stay in the Spirit and how to, how to receive the Holy Ghost. And it was just a, an encouraging little Christian newspaper that went out to all the folks around the world. But she stole the mailing list and went up to the northwest part of America and to the Portland, Oregon, and began her own apostolic faith and never would give it back. So he lost the ability to communicate with the people. So besides the split with Brother Parham and that, that division there, then the second thing was the student of the mailing list where he could not communicate to the world no more. All of a sudden, they just quit receiving the communications, and they didn't know why, and he couldn't get it back. And so she began to mail out her little magazine and never did amount to very much. And the, the influence of the began 
to fade away. But the Pentecostal experience had been born because of the evangelism heart within them, the idea that they received the heavenly language as well as the ability to speak an earthly language when they were called to go there and they begin to go around the world, even in the, on the, the big cruise liners of LA, out of the LA ports, out of the Frisco ports, they begin to go to Africa and to Asia and to Europe and to South America and taking with them the me Pentecostal message. And in a matter of just a few years, the Pentecostal experience was in all all over the world being taught and being received. And the young little Pentecostal churches begin to, you know, bounce up all over and pop up all over Africa, all over Europe, all over America. Louis Petros in Sweden, T.B. Barrett in Norway, uh, Alexander Body in England, and different ones were going to go into France, into Russia, into China, and they were going. Now, these people were people that were willing to take a, a little bit of a hit because early Pentecostalism, people thought there was something wrong. My grandmother, which is still alive, she's 88, she can still remember in her young years of Pentecostal experience when she joined the Assembly of God Church in Akron, Ohio, that people thought she had got some type of disease that affected her mind and would walk on the other side of the street from her because they didn't want to get the disease. Now, Charles Palm had some fun things with that. He would put in his advertisement, uh, it's contagious, it spreads hour by hour, and there is no cure for it. The Pentecostal experience is going to consume you and the whole world. He said, come and get the germ at this certain meeting. So he played the whole, the whole paranoia up as an advertisement, and people would run away from him, they'd cut down the tent, they'd throw re uh, rocks and eggs at the preachers and the people, and they thought there was something wrong with them. The evangelical movement, the holiness movement, thought they were insane. They called them uneducated people that were just having emotional, hysterical fits. Well, this hysterical fit and now is the fastest growing thing in Christendom right now. It is consuming the earth out of all the, the Christian expressions. The Pentecostal expression is the fastest growing part of Christianity in the world. It is absolutely consuming the earth. In Brazil today, we have people that are concerned. The Pope keep going, keeps going to Brazil to make sure he can keep a hold over Brazil because of the Pentecostal churches breaking the Catholicism hold over the country and getting them saved and spirit-filled and raising up churches and blessing the people. This would be, we receive power to go to all the world and to preach the gospel. This Pentecostal experience is not just a one-time experience. You know, sometimes people have said, well, I spoke in tongues once, 1942. I know I now got the Holy Spirit. But Howard Carter, the man that built the first Pentecostal Bible school called Hampstead Bible College in England, made this comment that I think is very, very good. He said, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a continual experience. It's not just a one-time experience where you feel the power and you speak in tongues and now you know you've received the Holy Spirit. But it is to be a continual feeling throughout your life. And I think it is so true. In the early days of Pentecostalism, we have uh, certain things that have begun to be coined and been, uh, become uh, doctrine that changed over a period of years. You have to realize the revival was a baby. And the baby revival takes time to grow. For like one, they had what they called tearing, meaning let's come and tarry for the Holy Ghost. Well, you don't tarry when he's already come. In the upper room, they were waiting for him to come. You and I, he's already come. All we have to do is receive him. But in the early days of the Pentecost revival, they didn't know any better. So they just went ahead and they just tarried and waited and tarried and tarried and waited. And they'd cry and boo-hoo and cry and wail and wait in the altar and do these things trying to get the Holy Ghost. And finally he would come and away they would go. But you don't have to tarry no more. He's already come. You receive him immediately and instantly by by faith. It, it, it's another thing that began to happen in the early Pentecostal movement is uh, all their, their shouting. They were called the shouting people. I tell you, when power comes in you, you're going to have a, a sound off inside, and it's going to come to the outside. And the, the early Pentecostals were shouting, running, dancing people. And so it scared some of your more uh, evangelical mainline denominations. They weren't quite ready for this. They were not proper, and they weren't in order. And they just ran and did all these things, and they got the term holy rollers. Well, what's a holy roller? Well, what it is is somebody falls on the floor, and for some reason or other, they just somehow start rolling under the power of God, praying or whatever. Maybe they just start rocking themselves, or God rocks them, whatever. And they got the term holy rolling. They started moving like that, so they were called the holy rollers. I think some of our Pentecostal preachers seem to be holy rolled today and get a little bit more loose than what they are. So many of them are acting like a dead denominational preacher instead of a living, powerful source they're supposed to be in their community. Uh, and maybe the young preachers don't look at them as an example of how you're supposed to be. Have a little bit of life in you, a little bit of joy in you. Get up there and do something. Don't be scared of men. Only fear God. Honor men. Respect men. Uh, but don't, don't uh, 
don't fear them. Fear God only. And these young Pentecostals, these young churches begin to come up. And these pastors were fired from their jobs. They didn't have a lot of money. You know, when you start a revival and you got folks who don't have a lot, they can't give you a lot either. So they were, you know, my grandmother's pastor, Reverend C.A. McKinney, was a Christian Missionary Alliance pastor that was a part of the A.B. Simpson movement. And uh, he wrote a letter to Azusa Street to have the, some folks come to tell us about the revival. But then he began to hear about all the caution. People in, in his friendship world and denomination world began to say, well, be careful. We hear there's problems. There's something not right. So he made a covenant with God. He said, if this really be of you, when these people from Azusa Street came, which were women, which I thought was real interesting, uh, uh, men didn't come, two women came uh, to his church in Akron, Ohio, and said, uh, when these people come and they stand up on the platform, these three people that I know their lives and I know they're godly people, if it be real, it'll come on them immediately and they'll speak in tongues if it be of God. Well, that's the way it happened. They came to God, picked up at the train station, brought them to the meeting the next night, introduced them as they came on the platform to greet the crowd and begin to testify about the apostolic faith, the Pentecostal restoration, and the primitive faith, however you want to call it. That's what they called it in those days. As they begin to speak all of a sudden, one by one, just begin to speak in tongues, and the shouts of God came on them. And Reverend McKinney said, well, it's of God. And he jumped up and got it himself. And later in life, my grandmother became a member of that church, and she received the Holy Spirit in that same meeting. You know, being a Pentecostal in those days is not like it is today. I don't know how to express it. I've said this before a little bit earlier, but I don't know how to express it. But in those days, you were the, the lowest person on the totem pole. You were the despised churches of Christendom. You were on the wrong side of the tracks. Not into the time of Or Roberts and Sister McPherson did the Pentecostals begin to cross back on the right side of the tracks. Uh, those two ministries helped move men into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Up until this time, they were always the lowest on the Christian totem pole. They were the, the weird people. They were the poor class people, the uneducated people. Uh, that was true, too. In the beginning, there weren't not many, many people educated that was among the Pentecostals. There were some, but not many. But what happened between the first and second generation of Pentecostalism, the first generation knew how to get the power, and then the second generation wanted to get the respect of man, and by the time you got to the third one, you almost lost the whole thing. You know, education is not a requirement. It can be used, and it's wonderful to have, but it's not a requirement. Uh, the heart condition is the requirement. Uh, it's nice to have an education. My mother is highly educated. I'm a self-studier, and uh, I love to study and to be knowledgeable about things, but it's not a requirement to be used by God. Your heart is. If you have an education, uh, God can use it, but you have to keep your knowledge submitted to biblical knowledge and submitted to the Spirit of God, which sometimes is hard for some people to do. Uh, Seymour, uh, at Azusa Street, he began to lose and began to wane. He stayed there and pastored all of his life. He died while he was dictating a letter in his office at Azusa Street, and his wife continued to pastor until her death a few years later. Reverend Parham, though, went through a few more challenges in his life. He was accused of immoral activity on the sides of homosexuality, which were not true at all. He was out traveling and preaching, and uh, there were those who did not like him. They were trying to have uh, trouble with him, and uh, they got in the newspapers, and they arrested him for uh, indecent exposure and so forth and so on. And mainly they were coming against him because they said that he had sodomized a young man and that somebody had proof of it. Well, they never came to trial. It was thrown out. But by the time he could actually say it was thrown out and there's no truth to it, well, the man in Zion, the man that didn't like him, got a hold of it, had telegraphed the San Antonio newspaper and said, what's going on? And the newspaper faxed back what they knew. And the next thing you know, Volvo and Zion had published that his palm was a homosexual and he was in jail for these things and he had, had confessed to these things and see what you've got involved in because you've got involved with this palm man. Well, here's another sad thing. Before Parham could ever state his case and say, it's not true, it's been thrown out, there's no truth to it at all, all the little Pentecostal periodicals picked up on it and began to write about these things that we should pray for Brother Parham because this is what's happened to his life. 